My name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. Uh, this is the worst time of the day. I, I do these right after lunch to do a lecture, because chances are a lot of you guys are going to find meditation right around now. And uh, so if you do, fine. If you got to get up and walk around, that's fine. I had a thought, why don't we go to the beach and just reflect on 5, 6, and 7 for the next hour, right? Um, <clears throat> I'll do the jokes. <laughs> So we'll, uh, we'll give it a go and uh, see where, where spirit takes us. Um, I remember the first time uh, I went to share my fourth step uh, with the sponsor back in New York. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, up until I was about to go to his house that day on the appointment to share step five with him, uh, to do step five with him, um, my sponsor in my mind uh, invented Alcoholics Anonymous. He walked on water without flaw. He was invincible. He was incredible and all these neat things. And then it came, day, it came to the day where I had to be at his house about one o'clock on a Saturday. And we were going to sit and begin step five. And my mind said, who is this guy? And why should I share this with him? And he's never going to get sex inventory from me. It's not going to happen. And I was back into managing and self-reliance and just a whole chunk of fear, wondering, okay, how do I do this now? And, and fear was gripping me. Um, but there was enough spiritual muscles within uh, where I hit my knees that day. He says, God, just get me to his house. The next thing there was a, a knock on a door, and I sat with him, and um, we began uh, this journey. <clears throat> with step five, with no expectations other than this is what I'm supposed to do, of what was going to happen to me. Because we can't start a spiritual process with an answer. We, we can't do it. Uh, I need to be in a place of completely unattached to the end, the result. Uh, my job is to suit up and show up and, uh, and just be teachable. And step one did that for me. Uh, the experiences of getting to Alcoholics Anonymous and being in AA for a while and untreated and, and hitting a bottom in AA as well as out there brought me to a place of, of the desperation of a drowning man. And uh, so that kept moving me. And like any other step, if um, I'm having a, here in AA, if you have a problem with step five, go back to step four. If it's step four, go back to step three. It's all a first step problem all the time. And... Uh, but I was made, it was made abundantly clear to me because the truth will find you. Whether it's while we're out there and we have this moment of, oh my God, I'm in outlook and I need trouble, I'm in trouble, I need help. Or when we're in here and we're floundering and we're going sideways and we bottom out and the truth will find you. And it was, it's not going to be pleasant when it does. Um, it was made abundantly clear to me from on a spiritual level, certainly not in the mind because you'd have a different speaker there if it, if it came there. Um, that I needed help and I was very desperate. So um, I began this journey with step five. And little by slowly, uh, I started to unload my inventory in step five, waiting for him to tell me, like, you need to go. This is, this is really bad stuff. And um, I remember him taking some notes, uh, asking me some questions, stopping me, uh, giving me some more considerations, and then relating similar experiences that he had in his life. And uh, very often he looked bored. I, I think he was meditating through half my inventory. But um, he listened. And it was really the first time before I entered therapy, uh, uh, about a year later or so, uh, that uh, someone else sat and listen to me without interruption, without judgment, without critiquing me. He just kept feeding me new truth. And uh, sometimes the new truth was, was difficult to swallow, but one of my teachers told me repeatedly, the truth is true until we find out it no longer isn't. So I was letting go of old belief systems, old ideas, old concepts about God, about people, about myself, about recovery, about Outlooks Anonymous, and uh, the futility and having a resentment and what that really turned out, how that manifested in my life, and I was getting it done. Now, the resentment part of the inventory was difficult, uh, but it was a, a, a walk in the park compared to when I got to sex inventory. Because I remember getting tight and reluctant to share this. And my sponsor, being very awake and not sound asleep at the time, saw that. 
And he says, how much uh, uh, shame and embarrassment do you have behind this? He says, before we continue, I want you to go home and write inventory on some things. On me judging myself, the fear behind that. On me judging, even sharing my resentment, having to share things like that. So I went home and wrote some more inventory, and I had to go back to his house the next day. And I read that inventory to him, and then that was enough to kind of catapult me just to go right through the sex inventory. And uh, that's the first time I ever heard of his in Ingford it's been done. Never heard that before. And he shared some of his experiences with me. Now, what was going on, I didn't know what at the time was, there was a bonding happening between me and the sponsor. And what was going on in there, I was finally emptying out and emptying up uh, without reservations, uh, without worrying what you were going to think of me. This was life or death. And a book says we're engaged upon a life and death there. And, and I got it. I got it in the fifth step. And um, uh, he challenged me on some things. That it was, I never experienced anything like this before. And I realized how God moves us through that because the last thing I would normally tell is someone, my deepest, darkest secrets, resentments, my sex life, any of that stuff. That's usually to go to the gray stuff. And um, when we got done, he gave me my instructions uh, to go home for an hour and be quiet. And that was the only time in the book it gives me a time frame in which to work with it. But it isn't an hour to do nothing. It's an hour to review the first five proposals, make sure I'm clear. You know, getting to step five, am I still clear that I'm an alcoholic and my life's unmanageable, drunk or sober? And that no human power can relieve me of my alcoholism? That God couldn't would have restored? Am I still looking to seek God? God's the only power that's going to restore me to sanity. You know, am I willing to turn my will and life over to care of God now that I've completed my fifth step? Or do I have reservations about that because I've completed my fifth step? Am I still looking to manage my own life, or is this going to be God's deal? Did I sneak something through the archway? You know, not going to tell my sponsor about this. He doesn't really need to know about this. And it's usually in the sex area. Am I been abundantly clear? And, um, and I completed the, those questions, and I realized it was the first time in my life I emptied out everything that God gave me. Because the interesting thing about step four is I take no credit for completion of that work or the completion of step five or any step for that matter. But specifically with four and five, I'm not writing the fourth step when it's done right. When I'm writing the fourth step, I'm writing the fourth step, which means I will conveniently forget, minimize, justify half the behavior, which I experienced my first time writing a fourth step. Right? But what we do is, I, I, I've been always instructed to write a prayer across the top of the page. Thank you, God, for allowing me to be searching for this and more, because the power to move through that inventory must come from God and not from me. Right? And then little by slow, you watch the pen become the spiritual translator, because God reveals to us. There's an interesting piece here. There's no amen after step three, but there is one after step seven, because I'm going into the searching. It's one movement. Complete step three, I do step three by four, and God's moving me into the seeking, into the uncovering and discovering, because I can't do that because I'd simply reinvent myself. Right? So God's going to take me by the hand in a sense and move me through. That's why when we write inventory, things get revealed that we go, oh my God, why is this coming to me? I can't believe I'm thinking of this. And some of it is incredibly uncomfortable, but it's all divine because the Father's revealing it to us, not us. So that's why the prayer and the silence and the prayer across the page before we write and off we go. And the same thing with step five. I need to pray to go show to this, this, this person's door and share. It's interesting. Uh, for years I used to think four and five were two different steps. Now they are on the shades, but it's one whole movement. See, step five says we've never completed our house cleaning. Those people get drunk because they never completed the house cleaning. Step five is part of the house cleaning process. What they did was they, they, they kind of filled in the loopholes. So they give us one for writing and one for discussion. But it's one movement. I don't, a solitary self-appraisal is insufficient. So I don't write my thoughts, I put it in a drawer. When I'm good and ready, I'll share some to you and some to you. But what I want to share, not what I don't want to share. We get drunk like that. So I write and then I go discuss. And God will give me the courage, strength, and direction to discuss whatever needs to be discussed. Every nook and cranny. I saw my, my judgments on what I thought a real man should be like and how I thought a real woman should be. And I realized why I'm having so many problems in personal relationships. 
I had old school ancient ideas about the roles of men and women. I got to see how I was playing God in every area. I was assigning God a role, assigning me a role, assigning others a role. And you had to, on cue, on my cue, do what I thought you needed to do. And so I was a magnet for resentments and wrapped up in a ball of fear and I can never move forward, always in my own way. And I got to see things like that. Now some of those revelations would come to me in six and seven, some of them would come to me in nine, as I start to experience what the fifth step promises talk about that we will get. A lot lot of that was not revealed to me at the moment as I was sharing when I completed my fifth step. But it certainly was given to me as God saw fit. So in that hour when I was instructed to go home, I thank God I made a prayer. And although uh, <clears throat> I didn't really feel like I knew God better, but I did thank Him. Because some of the fifth step promises will not come to me right after step five. A lot of that stuff came to me in six and seven, eight and nine, even in 10, 11 and 12. So I go into the searching with God, and God reveals, and I write the inventory, and I go and show up at a sponsor's house, and I discuss these step five, and I get back, and in the hour I do some assignments and reflect, prayer, meditation, and is there anything I've left out? Because sometimes things will come to me after the fifth step's happened to me several times, and I'll write more inventory. And I'll call up my sponsor and say, you know what, something just came to me that I completely forgot about. It just came to me now. Or there's something I really didn't want to tell you and I need to talk to you about. And we finish. So I finished step five. Now what's interesting, on the top of page 76, it says, if we can answer to our own satisfaction, the question's on the bottom of page 75. There's a shift that they're they're, they're talking about here that I don't need to check in with the sponsor in 6 and 7 and say, do you think I was thorough? Do you think I've answered all the questions? How do you feel? Should I move on to 6? This is between a me and God movement now. And if I can answer to my own satisfaction. And so if I'm clear on that, I move into the considerations for step 6. Now, as an interesting thing happened, my sponsor was taking notes, and I do this with men. When I sponsor, all my teachers have done this. Take a list of defects of character that keep showing up throughout five. I'll list them on a sheet of paper. My sponsors have done this for me. And I get a general idea. Defects kept showing up over and over and over again, wearing different hats, but the same defect. By the way, the the whole inventory, if we took our entire fourth step and dropped it in a funnel, one word would come out of your entire fourth step, and that's fear. But it just wears lots of different hats and plays a lot of different roles, but it's all fear, right? So I list these defects of character, and uh, what I do is, in six is, am I willing, willingness of being indispensable, they absolutely require, am I willing to let go of every one of these defects? Even though I don't know what the outcome's going to look like and where I'm going to land and where I'm going to go, it's really none of my business. In fact, step three on, my life is no longer any of my business. Where I go, what I do, where I live, any, any of it's none of my business. My life is still none of my business. And what I do is I ask God, If it's his will, not a petition to God, but simply let him know I'm willing that every one of these are considered an objection. I'm willing to that. Do you take them all? But we can't have a vacuum. And so what we write next to the defect is what the opposite of the defect is. Dishonesty, honesty. Hate, love. Whatever it might be. And I thank God for those things. Now here's what I have found out. It's not a petition to God to give me honesty or purity or trust or compassion for others. That's been given to me at birth. That's why I thank Him for what is already there. What has happened is I've accumulated dishonesty. I've accumulated uh, uh, jealousy. I've accumulated fear. I've accumulated belief systems on how relationships should look and how life should look. I've accumulated those things and they all need to go. The process of recovery is never addition. It's about removing the self, the self needing to die, experience the death of self before the physical death. And here's where rubber hits the road for many of us. It's the first step for life, as I was taught. Because what's left after all the work is done are some glaring defects that I might fight for my, I might hold on to and fight you to the end for them. They need to go. And if I don't go to God and have God deal with what's left after five is done, those defects will deal with me. And it will not be pretty. It will take me back to a drink. So how willing am I to let go of something that I'm not really sure it's going to happen when it does go? 
how much willingness do I have to be made new? So I offer to God the opposites in the form of thank you prayers, positive prayer. Thank you, God, for, for uh, allowing me to be honest, compassionate, uh, serving, whatever it might be. And it's a simple offering because going in, it's not like, I, okay, God, here's the defects I found. You remove them and give me these opposites. It's, Father, this is what was revealed to me. And God's going to do what he's going to do. In fact, some of the de- some of the things I think are glaring defects, they don't need to be removed. They just need to be tweaked only by the hand of God. What I think is good for me may be really bad for me. What I think is bad for me just needs to be tweaked a little bit. One of the questions I always like to uh, bring out to folks uh, uh, when they're talking about 6 and 7, so many of the meetings I attend, we hear the current agnosticism and folks don't even realize they're saying it. And it comes in 6 and 7 all the time. And it sounds like this. I'm never going to be perfect. I'm always going to be flawed. I'm always going to have defects. Well, perhaps true. But is it possible that if God wanted to, whatever your God looks like or or, or, or whatever denomination you belong to, I don't care. But if your God is all love and no opposite and is all powerful, is it possible that that creator came down and touched one of us on the head and said, from here on out, you will be perfect because I need to put you on a mission. I need to put you to, to work to do something very specific for me. Or just pack into the stream of life. But I'm going to deem you perfect from here on out. You will be character defect free. If I say that can never happen, then my God just got put in a very small box. Because they're not all things are possible with God. The likelihood of that happening is, I don't even know, it's none of my business, but I have to lend myself to the possibility of that happening, because just in lending myself to the possibility of God coming down and doing that, then my God gets incredibly big and all-powerful and all-loving. Some of the things we hear folks say, even inadvertently, just screams at agnosticism, and they're wondering why they're struggling. Back in step two in chapter two, agnostics says that God's going to be everything or nothing. And we say everything, and that means everything. Uh, uh, if we want to turn everything over to God. That means everything, including the things that we get joy and pleasure from, including the things we feel like we're all our ducks in a row. Everything needs to go, and the same here as well. And when I complete this body of work, I do a seven-step prayer. The seven-step prayer has an amen, as you know, at the end of it, because I'm out of the searching, and my job is to go from here and go make amends and reconcile and heal. The seven-step prayer has very little to do with me and a whole bunch about helping others. In fact, it says, grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. It isn't about making me a popular guy in Alcoholics Anonymous. Going through six and seven, I got to see how... Uh, 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 angry I was, even even subtle anger, how much contempt I had, and it manifested in different areas. Interesting thing. Love doesn't need to think. Anger always does. We need to replay it over and over and over again. And suddenly when those defects start to get grinded into dust along with the ego, I find myself very present. The book says we are reborn. Very present. How does that happen? By the removal of self in 6 and 7, which really prepares me to move into 8 and 9 because I'm generating a lot of power now to move me into 8 and 9. And I found when I was making amends that the, whatever was left of some of those defects in the process of amends, those defects started to get removed even quicker for having accountability and responsibility showing up to you and saying, this is the harm I've caused. That's huge for people like us. That's huge for anyone. And the only way that's going to happen is with a a current relationship with a God of my understanding. Six and seven becomes my first step for life. Um, I currently do the same exercise uh, with six and seven anytime. I just started going through the work again, by the way, with my sponsor. So I have no idea where that's going to take me or where, where I'm going to land. But I'm open to wherever it does. And, but I will still do the same assignment, enlisting the defects and the opposites and offering them up to God. And I will work with that a few days until I know it's not time to. And I've moved on. But I work with positive prayer. Thank you, God, for, because those are the things that were given to me at birth. Actually, before birth. So I don't need to ask for something that I don't, that I I already have. The other piece to that is, 
God doesn't care how I pray. I put unrealistic expectations on what the prayer should sound like and look like, etc. Really, God's not interested in that. But something happens to me when I go to God, and instead of saying, God, please take this fear from me, I thank you for courage, strength, and direction. There's a shift that resonates differently with me. And I move out from here thinking courage, strength, and direction rather than fear. And I've seen that little by solely get manifested in my life with thanking God for the opposite of defect, whatever that might be. Because that's what I was given to walk this journey. Everything I've been given, anything I need to walk through this life that God has given me, I was given at birth. When I get to this work with folks, one of the questions I ask them is this. <clears throat> God put us here. Why? Why are you here for? Why did God bring me here? Why did God bring you here? I usually get folks stopping their tracks and very present to a question like that. Because we're using perpetual motion. Got to do things. Got to move. Got to go. Got responsibilities. All these things to do. But why really did God put me here? It's interesting how our book answers that question to play the role he assigned. So how am I doing with the role he's assigned me? What's that look like? What I do for a living, whatever it is, am I bringing a vision of God's will into that activity? Yes or no? Because I'm either all in or I'm not. Half measures avail me nothing. How am I with my children? How am I with my money? How, how do I have integrity in everything I do or not? to play the role God has assigned. That's why he's been here to treat his other children. Now, what happens is if I'm loaded with defects, that is an impossible task to pull off because it's all about me. It's all about a self-seeking motive. It's all about what I can get out of this, even when I'm being kind to you. There's, some, there's a payoff for me all the time. Uh, an alky with a motive should be considered armed and dangerous, so I hope to have no motive. Right? So the defects, little by slowly, start to get removed. Now, here's what happened to me. I was attending a meeting in Brooklyn, New York, uh, the Bath Beach Group. I had done my uh, six and seven work, and I'm in this prayer, thanking God for the opposites. And when I finished at five, I remember I was just relieved that it was completed. And I remember feeling somewhat connected to people in AA more than I ever did. I'm going about my business, chopping wood and carrying water and doing all things I have to do and getting ready to do my eight-step list. And it was a Friday night meeting, and I remember having something come to me that I never experienced before. It was a shift, and it was a huge one. And I felt lighter than I ever did, um, more connected than I ever did. Um, it was something electrifying. The archway that I was passing through a free man at last was finally electrified. It was incredible. I didn't know what was going on with me. I remember calling uh, 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 my sponsor and telling about this, uh, my old sponsor back in Brooklyn. He knew exactly what was going on with me. And he, he broke down again the fifth step promises. And he told me what, what Mark, my sponsor, would tell me and my, my current teacher tells me, don't talk it away. Just be still with it. Because if I start to talk about the experience I'm currently having, what will happen is the mind might get in there and really kind of chop it up. I may get to someone who's agnostic and try to figure it out, the whole thing, and there goes the experience because I might listen to it. Just be still with it. And that's what I did. And then I haven't looked back. It's incredible what goes on here. So I have men now come to me with their fifth step. How do I teach what was given to me? In fact, one of the reasons why I continually go to the work is not so I can have a new experience produced by God only, because that would be selfish and self-seeking all over again. It's about what's going to happen to me that I can pass on to a new drunk who comes to my doorstep. How much more can I offer them? What else can I give them to help them have the experience I've had? But I don't go to the work just for me anymore. I have to take a look at how much ego is involved and I'm going to the work just for me. Right? So they show up to my door. What I do is, before uh, uh, someone comes to me with the fifth step, I go into the bunker. I hit the, my meditation mat, and I sit, and I get quiet, and I ask God to allow me to be an instrument for Him. Because this person is engaged upon a life and death era, and I need to be really clear on that. And go in with them, and pull out and see what's behind, behind uh, what they're writing. Because I'll listen to what they're not telling me, I remember one of my sponsors used to watch you shift in your chair as you were reading sex inventory, which means there's more to it. 
So I observe as I'm listening. But I prepare myself, and they come to my house, and I sit down, and I read some stuff out of our book. We make a prayer, and we get still. I usually ask them if I can keep a religious article on the table. If they don't object, I will. And I have a notepad and pen next to me. And this is how this goes. I let them know that I want them to read only what's on paper. Because we'll do this when we read inventory. I have a resentment with mom. Let me explain what happened. Right? And a half hour later, we get back to the paper, because I need to justify my resentment. But they don't get that kind of opportunity. I tell them I only want you to read to me what's on paper. Because God wrote the inventory, that's what I'm interested in hearing. From time to time, I'll stop them and ask them to explain. And I'll let them know I'm about to take notes. And not to be interested when I'm writing, because I'm doing what my sponsors did. I'm taking notes. So when we get to page 25, I can say, hey, you've been talking about this back on page 2, 3, 4. It's the same defect showing up in different areas of your life, just wearing a different hat or a mask. Over and over and over again, they get to see that. And I give them the same assignment I do to go home with these defects of character. And they know they can trash it, they can reinvent one, or they can use that list there. It's between them and God. A handful of years ago, um, I was sitting with a guy in Staten Island, New York. And I'm sponsoring this guy, and uh, I'll call him Joe. Joey Loopholes, that was his nickname. He was looking to find a loophole in everything in the book. And I think this was going to work. Uh, and as he was reading his inventory, he was, let me explain, let me explain, let me explain. And um, I had to take a break. I thought I was going to need a drink after this. But uh, I went into my bathroom. I'm throwing cold water on my face. I'm going, God, I don't know what to do with this guy. He's driving me to drink. I don't know what to do. His ego is still there. I don't know how to break the, I don't know what to do. And I went back to my living room table. I sat down, and I still don't know what God's about to give me. And what comes out of my mouth, I says, Joe, here's what I want you to do. Till I say stop, all I want you to do is read your fourth column to me. What do you mean? I have to adjust your fourth column. That's all I want to hear. That's what came out of me. I've never done that since. And he reluctantly agreed, and you start reading just the fourth column. self to dishonest, self seeking your frame. self to dishonest, self seeking your frame. And somewhere in there, this guy completely split right in front of me. I actually could observe, if you will, his ego being split wide open, and what was emerging was this spiritual being. It was incredible, the effect produced by God through another human being, me, and passing it on to another one of his children, this guy Joe. Well, he caught fire, and here was a guy who didn't want to talk about the book, start sponsoring people, would never walk into an A meeting without a big buck. The power of God. Incredible stuff that goes on. Running through inventory and hearing it or discussing it, what my teachers told me, I was able to uh, experience how real it was. When I'm writing inventory, even when we're discussing it sometimes, we think every single column is the truth. It is not. The first three columns turn out to be me living on a lie. And the only reality is what I did in column four. That's really the truth. And I get to see column one, two, and three as lies. I've been living on a lie. All my actions have been based on a lie, all coming from a thinking mind. And the truth is, this is how I behaved in four. With my selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking, and me being fear-based and insecure. And I behave in certain ways. And when God starts to remove that, it's interesting how I stop having problems in personal relationships. I'm no longer afraid of misery and depression. The bedevilments are gone. And when I continually rework the steps like I've been able to do over the years, more of self dies. If self will ever completely die, I don't know. But little by soul, I keep going through the work, and self starts to die, and I get freer. And free from bondage, whatever the current bondage might be. Because after a while, it may not be that I feel a drink coming on, but it's other behaviors or other fears or other thinking that is in the way and blocking me from this power. And the only thing that can remove it is this power. So I need to have a new relationship with this God. How many belief systems have I accumulated with the reemergence of ego and alcohol at Synonymous? Even though I might be speaking and sponsoring a whole bunch of people, and even thinking I do certain things well because the, the, the illness will get me where I think I'm really good, too. 
and I start to experience some uncomfortability and some suffering, and then it comes to me that there is no legitimate suffering outside of God's world. And why I'm suffering is I have my own little world going on. I got Pete Marinelli's little world of AA, where I am the king. And here comes suffering. Well, how did that happen? How did I shift into the different, knowing the difference between spiritual, between grace and spiritual fitness and kind of vision of God's will into all my activities and suddenly it's my little world? That's when trouble starts. But by revisiting the work and constantly disclosing myself to someone else, looking at defects that may have shown up again, and defects, by the way, they have relatives. They bring their relatives in. They have lots of friends. They like to come in once the door is open. Uh, what has resurfaced? all coming from this predator called the thinking mind, because that's where it all originates from. Have you noticed in some meetings we, we tell people, bring the body and the mind will follow? Why would, I, why would you want my mind showing up anywhere? Right? When folks say, I'm going to call them and give them a piece of my mind, I always tell them, if they're crazy enough to take your piece of your mind, give them the whole thing. Right? You're in big, great shape if you got rid of the whole thing. But what, what's manufactured up in this thinking mind is fear and all these defects of character, me playing God. It's just constantly turning it out, turning it out. And I return to the thinking mind looking for a solution where only problems are created. It isn't until I get to my 11th step that they talk about proper use of the will. When my thinking is cleared of wrong motives, my thought life is placed on a much higher plane because I'm experiencing oneness with God now that I'm a physical extension of this power which created me in the first place. Prior to that, pay no attention to a mind. Because I think of all my troubles, which are my own making, where did that come from? You, from you, no, it's from me. Even if you did something that was unkind to me, how I process and interpret that, it becomes my problem now. Because I can never move on. I can never forgive. I can never reconcile. It's got to be me against you. The other thing that's come out of this work, uh, uh, five, six, seven, moving into eight, nine, and then eventually growing and understanding this in 10, 11, and 12, is my concepts have shifted, changed even. May you find him now. Big exclamation. Go find this power now. The power of God, right? We're going to get this General Schwarzkopf to go fight alcoholism, which is fine. But that lends itself to, I have to fight another power called addiction or called alcoholism. I got God to go fight this other power, this negative power, this addictive power, whatever you want to call it. It is another power. The problem with that is, as long as I'm under the belief system that there is another power that might be almost as powerful or just as powerful as my God, I am catapulted into fear because that power just might win one day may not be working in my relation. It may be involved in my relationships, which means that's not going to be good. God may not be involved in my relationships. When we start to truly experience oneness with God, there is only one power. And that power doesn't have to fight anything or anyone, including booze. That's my 10-step promise. If I'm experiencing oneness with God, I walk with this power. It means I'm not fighting anything or anyone, including alcohol, whatever drug or no choice I'm involved with. There is no fighting. I can be alone at perfect peace and ease. The only way that's going to happen is fifth step promise if I'm experiencing that sort of oneness with this power, unattached from my thinking mind. Right? Not driven. When I'm driven by my mind, the external world owns me. Whether I want to admit that or not, the external world owns me and I'm experiencing current unmanageability. And the defects are starting to breathe again because they need to breathe. When I go to this work, it knows they're about to commit suicide, and it will fight with me to move through the work. The ego and the illness doesn't want to be unemployed. They like working. They like their job. They create drama. They create controversy. They create, create conflict. Right? We love drama. We love the voices. Right? I've said this from a million podiums. We love drama. You and I will get together. I'll talk to you about my drama. You'll share your drama. We'll have an hour of drama. And if we don't have drama, we'll get involved in his drama. And the three of us will invent drama. We will do something to get some sort of drama going. And the defects are stretching and growing and working out. They love this stuff. All generated from a thinking mind. And I start to regress on this path. Or am I growing? 
if we sit back and reflect on how many meetings we go to, how many six and seven step lectures we hear, meetings we hear, where six and seven is really talked about. Right? Don't do what you want to do, do what you don't want to do. I'm more confused on the way out than on the way in. And the big book gives us very clear instructions on what we ought to be doing. Turn it to God and God will mold us the way he's, he sees fit. Am I willing? Yes or no. If I had a first step experience, I don't care what God does to me. It has to be better than what I was. And by this time, I'm starting to have some sort of experience with God. There is a little bit of trust happening, uh, uh, a little bit of faith happening, so I'm going to continue to move. I'm turning it back to this power once more. I never tell folks, seek belief or faith. I mean, it work, might work at the beginning just to kind of bring you in here, but not to be a seeker of belief or faith. What we need to do is seek experience. Seek experience, seek experience. The first time I fell in love with Jack Daniels, I tried it. I liked the effect produced by Jack Daniels. I had an experience with it. Belief and faith wasn't going to do it. I believed you were getting loaded up with Jack Daniels. I had faith you were getting obliterated from Jack Daniels, but I had no experience with Jack Daniels until I drank it. And when I picked myself up off the floor and I had that glow, I says, I like Jack Daniels. So we seek experience with this power. We seek experience with the steps. What I, you know, what I do currently, uh, uh, I write nightly review every night. I do my 11 step with prayer, meditation, and nightly review. And I get to see any kind of defects that have been popping during the day that maybe I fell asleep from time to time. A little resentment, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. No resentment is, 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 is uh, uh, to be justified. They're all unacceptable. So I get to see some of this stuff where I fell asleep today, here and there. Maybe I owe an amends to someone here and there. And I get to see still and stay current with looking at 10 and the disciplines in 11 as to where I am on the spiritual path. And then the pieces I get to share with the sponsor. And I'm accountable, I'm consistent, I'm responsible with this stuff. And God has just made me this way. I couldn't will myself into doing any of this. This is how God has done it. And all I did was, I'll do anything. I'll show up with a spirit of willingness. How do I get a spirit of willingness? By blowing my life up. Nothing great on my part. I give all credit to God on my screw-ups. I'll take the credit for them. The defects, what they'll do for us, they will drive us away from God. They will drive us away from me and you, and they will drive me back to a bar stool or to a liquor store. That's its job, to pull me away from God. Because with the same passion that we can go through the work, we can rest on our laurels, and as soon as I start to do that, I'm headed for trouble, and the defects start to drive me away from God, and I can go backwards through the steps the same way I move forwards through the steps. Inventory and meditation are a thing of the past. Accountability with someone is a thing of the past. I have a sponsor name only. I'm not cleaning up the wreckage of my day in step 10, or even taking stock of my day. My amends list is growing. Defects are running wild. I'm still not discussing. I'm running the show. Old ideas are coming back. The manifesting in my life, I'm acting out, I'm acting like a drunk without a drink in me, and then I'm drunk. Bang, bang. And then we say, you hear what happened to Joe? He got drunk. How did he get drunk? He had 10, 15, 20, 30 years sober. Don't believe everything you see. There's someone who I really admire, and she always says, I never listen to the way a man walks. I always watch the, never listen to the way a man talks. I always watch the way he walks. How am I doing Greatest gut check in the world. Look in the mirror. Eyeball to eyeball with self. We know where we are. What are we going to do about it now? Turn back to, to the Father and say, okay, thank you, God, for the willingness to go to any lens to get recovered. Thank you for the willingness to grow in understanding and effectiveness. Thank you for the willingness to have a greater relationship with you. Because that's the great fact and nothing less than that. My relationship with this power called God, whatever it, she, or he, he is, doesn't care. What's my current relationship with God look like? Not the one I had five years ago. Mark called me up one morning. He says, <clears throat> did you eat today? I says, yeah. He says, why? You ate yesterday. I said, where are we going? This is like 6 o'clock in the morning. Why is he starting with me, right? And um, he goes, well, what happened if you wouldn't eat today? And I said, well, I get hungry. He says, then what happened? Well, I get hungry, and then I get sick, and I die. Bingo. What are you doing about the spirit? What kind of soul food are you getting today? 
Because what we did yesterday may not count. What are we doing today to get our soul full? What am I doing to nourish the spirit? We'll go to the gym, get a tan, get the right clothes, but what am I doing about the God relationship? Well, I did inventory 20 years ago, and it's a hell of experience. I'm miserable now, but I'm trying to replay an old experience currently. That's why we get twisted up in AA. And we look at the process of recovery as a linear one rather than the transformational one. Transformation, transformation. I could have 90 days and be sponsoring people. I could have 30 days and be sponsoring people. And I could have 20 years and be doing more harm to people. Because I can't transmit something I haven't got, but I will what I do. So how am I doing? Because any time I've got, gone a little sideways or my egos re-emerge, the men I sponsor get that. And so do the people who are involved in my life. They get that. Conversely, when I'm on, a, on the spiritual beam, as we like to call it, and I'm growing and understanding and affecting this, it's funny, when that's going on, I'm not even aware of it. But I am aware when something's missing. But the folks get that awakened spirit. And just what I do, it don't word indeed. I don't have to shout from the rooftops, hey, you got to get with God. They just are touched by an awakened spirit because it resonates. Incredible stuff that happens to us. I, I, I just get puzzled sometimes in our, in our sacred rooms as to why so many of us are still struggling when the information is here. I tell folks almost every one of us know how to get a phony script from a doctor to get meds. We know how to walk into the doctor's office and get a little prescription and we run down to the pharmacy to fill it and we run home and eat it. I have a prescription. It's a big one. It's 164 pages on how to get recovered. If I'm not running to the book, do I have a reservation, a lurking notion, or maybe I'm just a hard drinker? I don't get why we have something that works. It talks about permanent sobriety in the sacred rooms of AA. And we do, should I die, suffer and die, get recovered? Let me get back to you after I work on my 90 days. And somehow 90 meetings in 90 days has it replaced the power of God. And the fellowship has replaced the power of God. And yet I need to be living in all three sides, fellowship, recovery, and service, in order to be made whole. And I quickly locate myself. Intuitive thinking only comes from being current. Intuitive thinking only comes from having a current relationship with God. When I'm clear, I can hear. And I start to hear what God's ears I start to see with God's eyes, and suddenly what I'm speaking is not of me, but from the power. And that's how we're able to be of service to others. We get, guys, we get to heal. We get to touch the lives of others in a way that is indeed miraculous, and we get to heal the lives of others. Just another drunk work with another, or a drunk going into their home, their occupation and affairs with an awakened spirit, we get to heal the lives of others. We're no longer powerless. We get a tremendous amount of power, God's power, to go out and do His work. Back to the question. In order to do some of that work, if God wanted to make you perfect from here on out, He certainly could. Without a doubt. There's no doubt in my mind that that could happen. Anytime I start to limit stuff... I'm experiencing agnosticism, which means I'm in self-reliance, which means I'm having some current of manageability, which all points to fear. If I'm in fear, it's because I'm running the show, on, I'm in unmanageability, self-reliance, agnosticism. It's a vicious cycle. And I triple up on my meetings, and I'm getting sicker. And I look for external conditions to remedy an internal illness, and I'm getting sicker. And I say, AA doesn't work, but a double will. And then we drink and die. And then we talk about you. The responsibility is with us not to roll over in some of our meetings and say, it's okay not to drink and go to meetings, but lovingly challenge that. Never assassinate someone's character. But lovingly challenge with a, is it possible to fill in the blank? That's all I got. Peace.